Hey guys, good day. Hey, I put together some uh, a short study here about the trying to identify the Messiah, the Son of God, from the Hebrew Scriptures, and um, it's a few pages. I would I would encourage you to download this and uh, study it and uh, be prepared to to have an answer for those folks, maybe our Jewish friends that uh, know these Old Testament scriptures, the, their Hebrew Bible, and to identify where we know the the Messiah is. So before I get too far along, um, if you've ever been to a synagogue, uh, you'll know that uh, that the Jews hold the Word of God, the Word of God, in extremely high regard. The Torah uh, is what they keep. It is their word. They have the word of God. You can see how they treat the word of God uh, during one of their services. This is at the end of uh, the reading of the Torah where the, uh, where, the ra where the rabbi was preaching on it. And they're getting ready to put the Torah away. Watch, watch how they treat it. So they're, they're, they're carrying the Torah through the congregation. Everyone leans over and kisses it. They hold it very gently. And then when they're done with it, they put it in what they call the ark. That They put it away till for the next week. That uh, closet they call the ark. So there they were. They were, they were carrying, they were kissing the word of God. Now for us Christians, we know that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And for our Jewish brethren... At this point, uh, they have failed to see that. Now, does that mean they're all going to burn in hell for eternity because they die without knowing who Jesus is? Well, I don't know. That's not for me to decide. But if we go all the way back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, we see after the fall, after Adam and Eve fell, um, God makes a proclamation. He says, this is God speaking, I will put enmity between you, that would be you, the devil, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring, the devil's offspring, is the Antichrist and his minions, and her offspring, the offspring of the woman. He, that would be the offspring of the woman, maybe the Messiah, shall bruise your head, Satan, and you shall bruise his heel. Now we see this event bruising the heel maybe at the cross where Jesus was on the cross and his literal heel um, would have been bruised. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 18 that God himself through Moses promises a future prophet. He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, and it, and it is him that you shall listen just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, when the Israelites said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God because it's great fire any more lest I die. This is when the Lord spoke in Exodus 19 and it was like a loud trumpet and the Israelites could not hear it. And he says, <clears throat> and then the Lord says to, uh, to Moses, he says, I will raise up uh, for them a prophet like you from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them at all that I commanded now we know this prophet to be who we say would be the Messiah this is their future king promised to them their future leader promised to the Israelites not only the Jews in Deuteronomy 18 we also know from Isaiah 53 Isaiah 53 is a prophet prophetic book written about 700 years before Jesus. This, this prophetic book is essentially not read in the Jewish synagogues. They do not read it from what I understand. It is kept out of their, their daily readings throughout the year because it sounds too much, too much like the Christian Jesus. And if you actually read this to people without identifying what, where it's from in the Bible, they will think it's a New Testament reading it's it's so obvious that it's jesus now you most people who are watching this video are aware of it but look what it says it says but he the suffering servant was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities upon him the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed just like a uh, 
a sacrifice the lamb John the Baptist in the New Testament said Jesus was the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world so he was wounded his wounds are why we were healed now in Zechariah 12 this is future fulfillment this has not occurred this is when the Messiah who we know to be Jesus comes and it says this, and then the Lord will give salvation to the tents of Judah first, and to the glory of the house of David, and to the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And then God says, the prophet says, no, this is God speaking, I'm sorry. He says, and I will pour out on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him, see how it says that? This is God speaking. And when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. This is speaking about the Messiah. We know Jesus. And see how God speaks and refers to himself as me and him as if God is right there. Or that God and Jesus are really in the same and the one with the Trinity. We will get into that in a minute. So with that, I have a document here, and I would encourage you to learn this information and to study it with your Jewish friend. You could, you could, you could forward this video to them. Uh, most Jews, from their perspective, it is so far removed to even consider what we would know to be uh, the Messiah Jesus that it's, it's just against, uh, literally it's against their religion, number one. They're taught to not even consider this. But most Jews don't even recognize that the New Testament Bible in Matthew is all about Jews and the house of David. It's it's a it's a Jewish book, Matthew is. So let where do we where do we begin? So the biggest stumbling block is that Christians believe that God has a son and that his son is the Messiah. So let me go ahead and get started. So the Jews of today are eagerly awaiting their Messiah to come to the earth to set up the long-awaited earthly kingdom that will restore the promise made to King David. The Christians of today are equally awaiting their Messiah to come and take them to their father's house in heaven. See, the Jews are waiting for an earthly kingdom. The Christians are waiting for the Messiah to come to take them to heaven. It's a little bit different. However, the Jews have a differing view of the Messiah and have struggled to believe Christian theology, which states that the Messiah is the Son of God. So can we identify the Son of God from the Scriptures? The Hebrew Scriptures, that is. So the first place we can look where we directly see this connection between the Son of God and the Messiah. See, that, see, the Jews do not believe this. They don't believe that the Messiah is the Son of God. They don't even talk about the Son of God concept. But Jesus did, we know, when he was here. But if we read Psalm 2, I have Psalm 2 here. You, and if you look at the words for Lord and God, you can. it helps us better understand because there is a Yahweh, Yahweh God, and there's Adonai, and of course there is this anointed um, Mashiach or Messiah. So let me go through Psalm 2. So I came across a video, I'm sorry, a website where I saw this where it basically broke down Psalm 2 with the Trinity speaking and I looked at it and studied it for a while and I realized it was it was pretty true so when you read Psalm 2 it starts off in blue the blue is the Holy Spirit speaking it says why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord Yahweh Father and against his anointed and against his Messiah so they plot the kings of the earth plot against the Father and against his Messiah, saying, Let us burst their bonds and cast away the cords from us. The kings of the earth want freedom from the will of God and what God has planned for them. So here we see a connection where Yahweh, uh, Yahweh God, the Father, and the Messiah are connected in the same verse. Then it says this, the Holy Spirit says, He who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord, lower caps, Adonai, holds them in derision, contempt. Then he will speak to them in his wrath, and terrify them in his fury. And then God the Father says in green, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. 
Then we see the Son speaking in red. This is the Son of God speaking. And then the Son of God actually quotes what the Father said to him. So this green text is the Father speaking his words, the words, but the words are being spoken by the Son of God. And so Jesus, the Son of God, says, the Messiah says, I will tell the, of the decree. The Lord, the Father, Yahweh, said to me, you are my son. You are my son. Now, Jesus quoted this to the Pharisees, and he confused them, and they didn't come back and ask him any more questions. You can read about it in the New Testament. Jesus tested the Pharisees at the time, and they ran away with the tail between their legs. So Jesus says, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That word in the Hebrews, I have fathered you. Ask of me, the Father, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod. That word rod means half tribe of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. That rod is used other places in Psalm 23. It actually means half tribe along with a rod. I think that half tribe is a tribe that's going to assist the Lord. The warriors of the Lord are from the tribe of Ephraim. Then the Holy Spirit picks back up again. It says, Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord, all caps, Yahweh, with fear and rejoice with trembling. Now the Christian tra English translations say this. It says, Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. This is where the confusion for our Jewish brethren goes. And I'll go ahead and show you this. But verse 12 says, kiss the sun, kiss the bar, which means sun, lest he be angry and you perish away. So we're being told to embrace, kiss the son of God, lest he, the son of God, be angry and you perish in the way. We saw that up here that Jesus himself, or the Son, referenced himself as being fathered by the Father, by Yahweh. So we see a connection between the Lord being the Son of God, and how the Son is also connected up with the Anointed. So we see that the Anointed, the Messiah, is this Son. So that's how we can pick apart Psalm 2 and we can find the Trinity and we can see that the Messiah is the Son of God. And we're told here to kiss this Son of God lest he be angry. Now what do the Jewish interpretations say? So if I go to a Jewish website, Shabbat.org, now when they, this is, this is Psalm 2 written in English for us to read, where it says kiss the Son, they say, arm yourselves with purity, lest he become angry with you and you perish in the way. See, everything about this verse is exactly aligned with the Christian translations, except this first little part, arm yourselves with purity, where all the Christians translate, say, kiss the sun, lest he be angry. Now, I've looked at the reason for this, and there's, there's some little bit of confusion here about this word bar. But the bottom line is this. Look at the context. Arm yourselves with purity, lest he, so purity must be a he, he will become angry. So it would appear, based upon the context, that kiss the sun is a valid translation. But nevertheless, you know, that's a point we can argue with our Jewish friends, and I really would abstain guys arguing with that. Now we can see from Proverbs 30, this is written by, this, this is the words of Agar. Proverbs was mostly written by Solomon. And here we have a reference to the name of the Son of God being known. Let me go ahead and read. He says, the man declares, I am weary, O God. I am weary, O God, and worn out. So this, these words are written by somebody who is just to the point of death almost, being so worn out. And look how he identifies himself. He says, surely I am a stupid, I am too stupid to be a man. Essentially, God says you are stupid if you don't know his son's name. We'll get to that in a second. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor I have knowledge of the Holy One, who has ascended into heaven and come down, who has gathered the winds in his fist, who has wrapped up the waters in a garment, who has established all the ends of the earth. What is his name? 
That would be God, God the Father, Yahweh. And what is his son's name? Surely you should, you should know. So we have a direct reference in Proverbs 30 to the writer saying that he is identifying himself as stupid. And then he's, he's questioning others. What is the name of God and what is his son's name? Surely you should know. He's chastising folks who don't know the Son of God, the name of the Son of God. We can find that name in Isaiah 7. Now here is another, another part of Scripture from the Old Testament written 700 years before Jesus. And it's written directly to the Jews, the house of David. And he speaks about how he's going to give the Jews a sign and what his name should be. Now we know from Proverbs 30, he's saying, what is this? What is his son's name? So if we read Isaiah 7, starting in verse 13, we see this. It says, Here then, O house of David, that would be the Jews, is it too little for you to weary, weary men that you also weary God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which we know means God with us. He shall eat curds and honey, and when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose good, it goes on and talks about um, another event going. So this was this was fulfilled at the time of Isaiah, and we know it had future fulfillment at the time of Jesus. But here we see what his name is from verse 4 from Proverbs 30. His name is Emmanuel. Okay, so some of the Jews will say that this word virgin is not actually used in the original um, translation. It's really a young woman. But I was still I would abstain from getting into those arguments with these folks. Isaiah 9 is the is I guess the most difficult part of scripture, in my opinion, for Jews to not consider the claims of the Christian Trinity. Now the Trinity is extremely complicated and, and our little minds cannot comprehend it. We are to apprehend the Trinity, which we are just to accept it as is. But if we read what Isaiah 9 says, it just nails what Christian theology has for the Trinity, this Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look what it says. It says this, Isaiah 9, In latter days, those who walk in darkness will say to themselves this, For unto us a child is born, that child, this virgin conceiving and bearing a child, a son is given. Did God give a son? John 3.16 And the government shall be upon his shoulder. He shall be a king. We learn from Psalm 2 that God will make this king sit on Zion. Right here. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Right here. As for me, I have set my king on Zion. My holy hill speaks Yahweh. So back to Isaiah 9. And the government shall be on his shoulder. He shall be a king. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. That's the Holy Spirit. The Mighty Triune God. I added the word triune. Everlasting Father. God the Father. And Prince of Peace. So we have a child being born. A son being given. He will be a king. And his name will be these four references to God. How can that be? How can a child, a son that's given be called all these names. Well, the Christian teaching of the Trinity is the only answer. I'm not sure what our Jewish brethren would say to this. I haven't really spoken to them directly about it, but I don't know how they'll get around this. It's pretty straightforward. This is what we would call the Trinity taught by the Christians. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his own kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from the time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So up here when it says in uh, verse 6 that the Son is given, we can see that from the New Testament Gospel of John, John 3.16. John 3.16 is the most, I guess, popular and well-known verse of the Bible. And it should be. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave... Isaiah 9, 6, his only son, his only father, begotten son, right from Psalm 2, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but yet have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He's a savior. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the, in the name of the only Son of God. Right from Proverbs 30. So this is a New Testament scripture that has all sorts of connections back to the Hebrew scriptures. Now we see from Isaiah 62, this is one that's even more interesting here. In the Old Testament, when you see the word salvation, it really, it's Strong's 344, 3444, and it means Yeshua, and it means salvation. So all over the Old Testament, you'll see the word salvation. And go look it up in the original Hebrew, in Strong's, and for the most part, it's either Yeshua or Yesha, and it means to be saved or salvation. So Isaiah, and God even sends this salvation. So let's read what it says. It says, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet. Unt until her righteousness goes forth as brightness. And her Yeshua, her salvation, as a burning torch. So the Yeshua is going to come as a bright light. We learn about that in Psalm 50. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the ends of the earth, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation, your Yeshua, comes. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense is before him. So when you read the context of verse 11, this salvation is a him, it's a he. And Jesus even mentions this reward in the book of Revelation. He says, I come quickly and I bring my reward with me. So Isaiah 62 verse 11 is one that you definitely want to share with your with your uh, your Jewish friends. And if they happen to be able to speak Hebrew, get them to read this in Hebrew. Because they will say this, I can't speak the Hebrew but one word. They will say, behold, the Lord is proclaimed from the ends of the earth. They'll, say, they'll be saying this in Hebrew. And they'll say, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your Yeshua comes. And you will, when you hear the word Yeshua or Yeshua, you'll know they're saying Yeshua. And you can ask them you know, that they're saying Jesus. And you can ask him, say, what does it mean that your Yeshua comes and he's a him with a reward that will greatly confuse him? I've done this before to a guy on an airplane one time. And he read it. And after he read it, he shut up and wouldn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> anyway. Okay. I think I just read this right here, Isaiah 62. So Isaiah 63 is another interesting jewel from the New Old Testament that really speaks about the Trinity. I just came across this the other day and I realized, I said, wow, it's got the Savior, which is in green. Right here in green. It speaks of the Holy Spirit and it speaks of the Father. This is a good lesson here, Isaiah 63, on why the Old Testament scriptures are not fulfilled. See, a lot of people just in the Christian churches think the Old Testament, Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Well, yes, he did. He did, the, he did come, and he will come to fulfill the law and the prophets. But he hasn't fulfilled all of them yet. He will at his second coming. So we know in Revelation 19 that when he does come, he comes and his robe is dipped in blood. So knowing that in Revelation 19, when he comes on a white horse in glory and in victory to take back the world, to throw the Antichrist into the lake of fire, his robe at that time in Revelation 19 is dipped in blood. Now why is it dipped in blood? Well, let's read about it. Isaiah 63. Who, who is this that comes from Edom in crimsoned garments? He who was splendid in his apparel, marching in greatness of his strength. And this is the Messiah with crimson garments speaking. He says, it is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. By the way, salvation is his name. And they ask him, why is your apparel red and your garments like those who've tread the winepress? He says, I have trodden the winepress alone and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained my apparel. Think about Revelation 19. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I looked, and there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own right arm brought me, my, brought me salvation, and my wrath 
upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk with my wrath, and I poured out my their life blood on, blood on the earth. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he, now we're getting to the third person now, and he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved him. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all their days of old. But they rebelled and they grieved his Holy Spirit. See, this he has a Holy Spirit. David prayed that the Holy Spirit would not leave him after he sinned with Bathsheba. The Spirit hovered over the waters in Genesis 1. This is the same Holy Spirit that the Christians talk about. David himself had this Holy Spirit and pleaded with God that it would not leave him. Therefore he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. So if you read Jeremiah 4, the people in Jerusalem, when Jesus comes, when their Messiah comes, they're going to think he is their enemy. You can read it in Jeremiah 4. Lamentations 2, the Lord says that I have become like an enemy to my own people. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people where he who was brought up out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock, where he was put in the midst of them by his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses. That's the angel of the Lord who was with, uh, with, with Moses. And then it jumps down here and says, For you are our father, through Abraham does not know us, and Israel does not acknowledge us. O you, O Lord, are our father, our redeemer. From of old is your name. So guys, I would, I would say read this and understand this, this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that are embedded in Isaiah 63. And then there's a reference to Jesus or the Holy One of Israel. You see that reference a lot. I put some scriptures together of the Holy One of Israel. Jesus himself is the Holy One of Israel. And you guys can read this. I'm not going to go through all of them. But I want to talk about Isaiah 17, 7. So I'm going to jump back to the regular Bible here. And just give you some timing on when this event occurs. Now we know that Trump just ordered all the, all the troops out of Damascus. And we know that maybe Damascus will become a heap of ruins soon, which kicks off the harvesting rapture. And you can see right here, when, this, when Damascus becomes a heap of ruins, then Ephraim will have its fortress disappear. Then there's a remnant that comes out of Syria. Then it says this. Uh, this chapter, verses 4 through 6, are all about the harvester gleaning, standing grain. This is the rapture right here. And then it says this, And in that day, man, mankind, will look to his maker, that would be God the Father, and mankind's eyes, the eyes of all men, will look on the Holy One of Israel. I think this is an event during the three days of darkness where Jesus himself comes to every house and will show himself and allow everyone to either accept or reject him. So guys, just look for that day. And then it says down here, it says, and then on that day, the harvest will fly away or flee away in a day of grief and incurable pain. And then there's great war the rest of the verses of Isaiah 17. But guys, with that, download this document. Learn these verses on how you can identify the Son of God, the Messiah, from the Hebrew Scriptures. And do what you can to pray for your Jewish brethren to share this information. I didn't put Isaiah 53 in here, but I would, I would um, recommend that you read Isaiah 53 and just explain this idea of this Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. With that, guys, have a great day, and God bless you.